Hi, this is John Buck. Uh, this is another array signal processing video, and in this video I'm going to talk about spatial covariance matrices. Uh, when I have a narrow band signal model observed by a array of n sensors, I represent that data as a column vector of n complex numbers, each of which is basically the magnitude and phase of the narrow band signal observed by that sensor. When we start to work in adaptive array processing, the, one of the important ideas is how correlated are the signals observed at any pair of sensors. The spatial covariance matrix is basically a single mathematical object that's an n by n matrix, and every entry in the matrix tells me how correlated any two sensors in the array are. I can pick any pair of sensors, go to the corresponding element in the matrix, and that will tell me how correlated the signals and noise in the environment are as observed by that pair of sensors. So this is a convenient single mathematical object to hold all that information together. We'll also see that it's the heart of adaptive beamforming as we move forward. And so in this series of videos, I'm going to talk about the definition of it, talk about how we uh, process or the, or the properties of spatial covariance matrices as we apply linear processing to them. I'll show you a couple examples, and then also talk about a nice geometric image to have in mind to interpret what different kinds of processing are doing as we move forward looking at different adaptive beamforming algorithms. Okay, so let's switch over to the whiteboard and get to the nitty gritty. Okay, so for a spatial covariance matrix, we say we're going to use the uh, notation consistent with the Van Trees textbook. We would say the matrix capital S of X is the expected value of x, x Hermitian, where x is our, or x is a n by 1 vector of complex phasors. Representing the narrowband signal, observed on an array of n sensors. Okay, and so that's it's sometimes also called the uh, the uh, cross spectral matrix in in some older books uh, because the idea that we're compare these would be related to compare comparing pairs of sensors. Right, if I break this down, I could say if I look at oh the other thing I should mention is is we'll often also say S of n or maybe with a capital N rather would be the case when I have just noise present. So the expected value if I took the vector just for the noise. This would be the spatial covariance of the noise. And that will also be important for some of the beamformers we're going to see. But if we if we break this down, if this is a column vector, right, this will give us an outer product. So I have an n by n matrix I'm taking the expected value of. And if I went and looked and said, well, let me look at S of x and I pull out, say, the lth row and the mth column, what I'm saying then, when I look at this, it, that element would be the lth element of x. And then going the other way, I'd have the conjugate of the mth element of x with itself. So it's comparing the lth and mth sensor in my array, depending on, on how I've indexed them. They, they, this is the uh, pairwise, this is a correlation function. We will often be a little cavalier in our terminology and switch between correlation and covariance almost interchangeably because of the conditions under when is a correlation equal to a covariance. Well, if you don't remember, pause for a minute and try to remember when is a correlation of two random variables the same as the covariance of a pair of random variables. Okay, if you're back, right, the, the two are equal if the expected value of the random variable x of m is equal to zero for all then the correlation matrix and covariance matrices are equal. Right? There's no difference between correlation and covariance. And so that's why we're sometimes 
and in the case where we're assuming X are these complex Gaussian vectors with zero mean for most of our narrowband signal models, that's true. So that's why you can hear people be somewhat, including me, be somewhat uh, inconsistent about whether we call this a correlation matrix or a covariance matrix, because with the zero mean, they're both the same. So now that we've seen these, let's talk about what happens when we start processing them with linear filters. So let's consider the case where we're going to define a, a new variable x tilde, a new random vector, that is some deterministic linear function of the original one. So this is again is our, our, our random complex random vector. But A is some deterministic matrix. Right, and so the things we care about with random variables in general, of whether they're vectors or scalars, is what's the, the moments? What are the first few moments? So the, the first question is, what's the expected value of x tilde? And this follows pretty directly from just using properties of expectation. I can plug this in, definition for x tilde. And I should be clear here that tilde here is not necessarily, not at all the perturbation like we were talking about last time. I'm just using it for a sort of changed version of x here. So we're saying some some change under this linear transformation of x, of a, right? We apply this linear transformation a to x. And then we say, well, a is deterministic. I can factor it outside. And so it says that uh, the, the new mean is equal to a, the matrix a, times the, the old mean vector, which has an important implication for us, which is if the expected value of the original data is zero, a vector of zeros. So is the expected value of the transformed data. So if I have zero mean data and I apply a linear operator to it, I still get zero mean data out. The second thing we want to know is what's the new covariance matrix, right? I say if I if I applied this transformation, what's capital S of x tilde? Well, again, just starting from the definition. I get it's s of x tilde, s of x tilde Hermitian. And then I plug in the definition for each of those from above. So I have ax times ax Hermitian. If I take the Hermitian of this thing in brackets, I switch the order and conjugate each one. So I get the expected value of a times x times x Hermitian times a Hermitian. Right? And so when I look at this, again, the A's are deterministic. The randomness is inside. And so because this is a, expectation is a linear operator, I can bring it inside the A's here and get this. And then I recognize this inner expectation is the original spatial covariance matrix for my original X. Right, so it says, and this is sort of the the uh, vector version of a property we already know, which is that if I multiply a random variable by a scalar, I square that scalar when I scale the variance. Right, the valence variance is scared, uh, scaled by the square of the the constant, and so this is the vector form of it. In fact, if this went back to a singleton thing, these would become a squared. So if these were all scalars, and this thing, this equation still works. Uh, but when they're vectors, I do have to worry about the order of multiplication. And so I've got a separate thing here. Right, so these are two important properties we will, we will use a lot. It's worth thinking about a very particular form of A that is our favorite form of A in the beamforming world, right, is what if A is the weight vector Hermitian? So let's see how that sets up. Okay, so now we say, you know, in this case, I, the beamformer we've been looking at all semester, I got a complex scalar y is the inner product in complex form of this weight vector w Hermitian times the complex vector x for the data. Right? These are my array weights. This is my data. Well, in this case, I can use the formulas from the previous page, just recognizing that my a is now w Hermitian. Right? When I do that, let's see what I get. Well, for the mean, as we've seen often, 
right? We've been assuming for all the models with complex Gaussians that, that this expected value of x would be zero. That says the beamformer output is still zero. So the, the y is a complex number at zero mean. And what about for the second moment? We want to say, well, what's the expected value? Right? We could say capital S of y, but because y is a scalar, that's also equivalent to saying what's the variance of the complex number output, this complex random variable. What's its variance? We get that will be W Hermitian times the covariance matrix of the input times W. So this is what's often called a quadratic form. So it tells us the average power at the output will be this W Hermitian, right, which is a, when I take the Hermitian, this is a long row vector times a square vector. That's going to be n by n. So this will be 1 by n times n by n times n by 1. That gives me my scalar y, right? Sometimes it's helpful to draw these little cartoons of the dimensions. And so it says for any, for any beam former, my expected output power, my, my output is, if the input zero mean will still be zero mean for these complex uh, re random variable representations of narrow band processes. And the output power will follow this form. So those are results we'll use a lot, along with other versions of A that may be matrices to understand uh, how each step, if, if we think of W as being factored in terms of a bunch of things, how each piece of that affects the output. Okay, and so uh, let's finish with two important pieces of vocabulary about covariance matrices, uh, and then uh, I'll go on to some examples in the next video. So the first one, if, we, if you find yourself in the wrong trivia night at the wrong pub, uh, you may end up in linear algebra triple, trivia. The first one is a matrix with this property is equal to its own conjugate transpose. Pause the video for a second, try to remember what that's called. The answer for this one is, what is a Hermitian matrix? We call a matrix Hermitian if when I take the conjugate and the transpose, I get the same thing back. This is true for all spatial covariance matrices. So any spatial covariance matrix is Hermitian. Just by, and that follows from the definition, that is the expected value of that outer product. You can work that through. So any spatial covariance matrix is Hermitian. Second one, any matrix with this property is constant on the diagonal. So if I look uh, like on the main diagonal or just one above or one below, <clears throat> one above, everything on that diagonal is the same value. I go up another one, it's still equal to that. Right, so if I sort of look at, draw a cartoon of the matrix, not only is it equal, constant, some C0 on this matrix, but it would be C1 all the way down here. Maybe call it C of minus 1 for the sub-diagonal. So each of these would be constants going down these diagonals. So pause the video for a minute, see if you can remember what that's called. So that's called a toplets matrix, anything that's constant on the diagonal. So any spatial covariance, and it turns out any spatial covariance matrix for a uniform line array, which are the arrays we think about most of the time in this class, th that's observing a wide sense stationary spatial random process is a toplets matrix. So that, that for most of the spatial covariance matrices we're going to see, while well, they're all going to follow the first one, and most will also be toplets. So what we're, we're seeing is that spatial covariance matrices will be generally Hermitian and toplets because the, the ones we're going to be concerned with come from uniform line arrays looking at processes that are spatial, spatial wide sense stationary. That doesn't mean not necessarily that nothing's moving. What it means is that the correlation between two points depends on only on the distance between them, right? The same way that if I have a wide sense stationary time process, the correlation between two points x of t and x of u only depends on t minus u, the same thing will be true here, that the correlation between any two sensors in my array will only depend on how many, how far apart they are for something that is spatially state, wide sense stationary. All right, so that's a lot for this one. I'm going to stop here and then go on and talk about some of the other ways we can think about these matrices.